Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks. Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist, D.T. from Weather Risk, here, your commander of chaos, your colonel of confusion, your captain of catastrophe. Let's talk about this week in weather, and uh, quite a bit to talk about, even though it's April, the winter season's over, the spring season with severe weather season's underway here, and we've had now three significant severe weather events over the past three weeks. But the uh, pattern looks like it's got quieting down a little bit here. And I don't think we're looking at any more significant severe weather outbreaks for the next two weeks. So let's get right to it and see what's going on. First, I wanted to show you the drought monitor map. Now, a lot of you folks in the eastern United States are not really paying attention to this too much. Some of the farmers are. We're getting some dryness here in Virginia, North Carolina, eastern mid-Atlantic. It's very light stuff, not a big deal. The main issue here, though, uh, for those of you who are involved in, you know, I don't know, grain weather trading, um, that sort of stuff, or commodities. The, uh, the drought in the plains here is getting is pretty bad. And uh, what's happening is that the weather pattern keeps producing all these big storms uh, in the Midwest areas, but they keep missing the, uh, the plains region. So this area here grows a lot of America's wheat and it's in pretty bad conditions. So if you blow this map up, just to show you, I want to blow it for one second if I can. You see the dark red areas here, right? That's drought condition four, which is really severe. And then the dark, the red areas around it is drought condition three. So there's a lot of D3 and D4 conditions here. And it's really having an impact on the farming and the agriculture here in the Plain States. Now, it hasn't spread into the west and the upper Midwest. The Dakotas are a little on the dry side, but they've had a lot of snow and that's going to be melting over the next couple, or next several days because of the warming temperatures. So that's going to help their moisture. But the, these areas here have not seen any snow, they've not seen any rain. To show you what I, and, and you can see what I'm talking about here. This next slide here, this is soil anomaly map, and you can see uh, that uh, things have really changed. If you compare, you know, these maps, of course, are archived. You can go back to January, whatever, uh, last September. And you can see that, of course, the West Coast, the whole Rockies was in dark orange and yellows and reds here. Uh, now look how saturated California is and Nevada and, the, and Utah and Arizona. I mean, it's really quite Western Colorado. They're really saturated conditions. Meanwhile, as you can see, uh, we have some dryness here in Virginia, mid-Atlantic, uh, not too bad yet. Um, so that's of some concern, but this is that's not a big deal. The main concern here is areas from Texas up into Nebraska. Uh, and they're to continue to see really, really uh, no, no, no significant precipitation here. And uh, let me show you what I mean in terms of the rainfall. Uh, this is um, here the last seven days, and you can see a wall of the rain has fallen. Again, notice, let me just bring my arrow here so you can see it. There you go. And you can see the, the l tremendous amount of lack of rain here in the winter wheat areas of the Plains regions. Now, the Dakotas, this was the big snowstorm they had a couple of days ago. A lot of this is snow also here, rain. And you can see pretty good rains here. Dryness here in the mid Atlantic last seven days. But if you look at this, if we can blow it up in the, in just to show you an idea of the last seven days, this is unbelievable dryness here. They just can't buy a raindrop in western Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, eastern Colorado, Texas. And this is the last 60 days. Look at this. Can you believe this? This is the last 60 days. Look how dry it has been in Kansas, western Oklahoma, and Texas. Just unbelievable. Really quite remarkable here. All right. So uh, I just want to get pointed out to you folks. Let's take a look at some subsurface temperature readings here. Here's the western hemisphere. Uh, and again, the black arrow shows you the cold water from in the eastern Pacific from Alaska. You can see all the way down to um, Baja California, uh, very pronounced here. You can see that. And then uh, let me uh, cut this out. And then you can see the green arrow here is the warm water developing off the coast of Peru. Now, remember, only a few weeks ago, this was all the cold water, the La Nina. This is now dead, completely dead. And the warm waters are exploding off the coast of Peru. Look, on, look here. These latest values from uh, April 3rd and March 30th. And you can see, look at this. 2.2 degrees centigrade already in region 1.2 off the coast of Peru. Already 2 degrees centigrade above normal. And the models are going bonkers with this El Nino. I mean, they're just absolutely going bonkers. Here, take a look at the latest CFS and European. So the image here on the left, that's the, the this is actually, I, let me change this. This is not the CFS. This is the Australian model and the European. You can see. And so model. So, uh, here is the Australian model. Now, let me blow this up. You can see it. I want to bring this bring forward here a little bit. Um, okay, so you can blow it, see it up a little bit here. 
Look at the Australian model. Look at the day here. This is, this is March 25. And look at the green line, which is the ensemble mean. It has 2.4 degrees centigrade. There it is. You can see it right here. 2.4 degrees centigrade by August. Okay, just unbelievable. It reaches weak El Nino by May next month, by the middle of next month, and then moderate by July, and then strong, this is strong El Nino up here by uh, August, September. You know, this might be in the top five strongest El Ninos on record, according to the Australian model. Now, I'm not forecasting that, but that's what the Australian models are doing. Now, when this came out on March 25, the Australian model was by itself. Everyone's like, okay, yeah, sure, okay, really extreme. But then here comes in the European model. And let me bring this forward. Yeah, there you go. Um, here's the new European model. This is as of uh, April 1, as you can see at the top. And then look down here. Look at the red lines explode. And again, the big spread here, but this is all 2 degrees centigrade, is, moder is strong El Nino. That is strong El Nino conditions. So not all of them get warm, that warm, but a lot of them do. And the important thing here is that this, these red lines are warmer and warmer with each run. This, uh, these red lines back in, uh, in, in March were down here, and in February were down here. So as we're going closer to the summer months, these red lines are going up. And that is not a good sign. Now, obviously, there's implications for the hurricane season. For the summary, in terms of the weather and conditions, whether we're going to get any heat waves or any droughts or that sort of thing, generally it's hard to get a sustained drought in in the central and eastern U.S. when you have an El Nino. You get a lot more rain, and you also don't get a lot of heat, sustained heat. It's humid, but you don't get a lot of sustained heat. And obviously, if the El Nino is this strong, it's going to impact the hurricane season in a big, big way. So that's that, that, that's something. Now, again, if we keep the negative PDO here, if the cold water stays until the summer. That could help the Atlantic hurricane season be close to normal because this would counteract the El Nino. The negative PDO would counteract El Nino. We don't know if that's going to happen, but that's a possibility. Okay. If we look at sub-seasonal conditions here in the next couple of weeks, here's the MJO forecast, and you can see that um, the uh, MJO maps here. This is from August 3rd uh, and, um, excuse me, August 3rd, <laughs> August 4, August 5. And you can see the GFS uh, was taken into phase eight. The new data does not do that. I did not post the new map here, but I should have. The new uh, data does not have that, so this is wrong. And then you can see here that the uh, uh, European uh, keeps it in phase eight. So it, it, it goes into phase seven and then goes back to the neutral circle in the European. So let's assume that it stays in phase seven, right? Let's assume that this is correct. It's going to stay into phase seven, okay? If that's correct, then what we're looking at for the next 10 days is this. Here's your temperature precipitation on the top, right? And here is your temperature at the bottom. So you can see it's fairly cold for everybody. There's no sustained big heat, okay? And then you have a lot of rain uh, in the deep south and the eastern United States. Some rain in the, in the wheat area in the plain, southern plains, so that would be good for the drought. Um, but it's fairly wet, like I said, mostly east of the Mississippi River. That's what phase 7 does, okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, now let's take a look what's going on. These are recent conditions here. You can see this is the jet stream map as of April 3rd. Here's the temperature anomalies for the past seven days. You know, the trough was here, the ridge was here, so that produced your blizzard. It came right out of, out, right out of the Rockies into the Dakotas. And uh, then south and east of it, it pulled up a lot of warm air, um, very mild conditions, especially south of Interstate 70. But you can see it's pretty warm last seven days. We all know that. All right. We showed this one before. That's the last seven days of rainfall nationally. All right, right now, this is what we're looking at here as of this Thursday midday. The cold front is pushing into the east coast. It doesn't have a lot of activity associated with it. Now, the southern end of the front, as you can see, has more rain here in Texas and uh, southern Arkansas, Louisiana. And that, the southern end of the front is going to stall here. So the big issue is this Easter weekend. There's a lot of rain coming up here on Friday and Saturday across the deep south as the southern end of the front stalls, right? You can see that very clearly. But... As you can see here, uh, the rain on the European, this is the European. So this here is Saturday, uh, 11 a.m. And this here is uh, early Sunday morning. Notice the rain guts into the Virginia, North Carolina border. It doesn't get any further south of that. So all of this Easter Sunday looks great. Now the issue is down in here, okay? Saturday looks very wet. Friday looks very wet in the deep south. But, but as you can see by Sunday morning, it's sliding off the coast. This big high protects it. 
So it looks like the southern states are going to have a decent Easter during the midday and afternoon hours. But Virginia looks dry, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, next to the rain band all looks dry. So it looks okay there, not too bad. And it's going to be sunny in the Great Lakes and New England and New York State and that sort of thing. Here's the GFS, the same sort of thing. Now the GFS does bring the rain Saturday afternoon into southern Virginia, light rain. The heavy rain stays south of the Virginia-North Carolina border all the way down to Alabama. And then by Sunday morning, this is 10 to 11 a.m., the rain is way off the coast. You see that? High pressure builds into Virginia, so it clears out the sunshine in Georgia and Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio Valley, Mid-Atlantic, and New England, Great Lakes. Easter Sunday looks great. Not particularly warm. I mean, it's not going to be like 80s like we are now. Uh, it'll be in the 50s and 60s, but it'll be okay. Total, total rainfall here from this on the southern states, you can see a pretty good rain here from Georgia to the Carolinas over the next five days. All right. Temperatures, look at that. Because of the high pressure and because of the cloud cover and the cold fronts here, you're going to get these temperature anomalies over the next five days. Way below normal here for April. And of course, right now, it's way above normal. We're in the 80s and a lot of places are in the upper 70s. So yes, this is a big, big flip. All right. Now, after that, what happens? Well, this is the uh, European model from yesterday. You can see the date at the top, April 5. And let me call it up here so you can see. Okay, so there's April 5. Here's a big trough right here coming in. And we get this big upper low which forms in the Gulf of Mexico. So what happens is when you get a trough here, you get a ridge like this. But the upper low undercuts it. You see how the upper low is moving underneath it? So that forces the ridge to expand into the Midwest, the Great Lakes of New England, Mid-Atlantic. So it becomes quite warm over the plains in the Midwest into New England and, and the Great Lakes area. This upper low is, sits here. Now the new run continues that, but look what happens. The upper low is now over Louisiana. So you see the huge red area here? You see that huge big red area? That's your positive anomaly. There's your trough right here on California and Oregon. Okay, so this trough causes the ridge, but then the upper low forces this ridge to expand into Quebec, Canada, into Ontario a big springtime outbreak for Eastern Canada. Look at that. Those guys are going to love that stuff, let me tell you. And of course, this upper low presents a problem because there's going to be a surface reflection. And the issue is what's going to happen. Let me show you. OK, so this slide here is valid for Wednesday, April 12th. You can see the low here in Louisiana. See that right there? There's the high blocking it so it's beautiful in North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Illinois, Great Lakes, and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, great, southern New England, everything looks fabulous, just fabulous. Lots of sunshine, low humidity. But look at this low right here, okay? Now, if this was May, I'd be really concerned this could become a subtropical storm or maybe even a tropical storm. And then it just lingers there. Let me show you. Now, this here is Thursday, April 13th, and there is the low on the north central Gulf Coast. Right now, the high is still protecting us on the mid Atlantic, but the high moves off the coast and the low decides to come off the coast, bringing rain into the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and we could use the rain. So, this would be good to see. But is this system going to be tropical? Is this system going to be tropical? I don't know. It might develop some tropical characteristics. It has happened before in the Gulf of Mexico in April. I don't think it's going to happen, but I can't rule it out. Let's wait. It might just be a regular coastal low, you know. A, a regular low pressure area. It might not be a mid, it might just be a mid latitude low. It might not be tropical, subtropical, but it's possible. Uh, I think this one in particular has a shot of being subtropical, developing some tropical characteristics. So let's see if that happens on April 13th next week. And then again, we're hoping that it brings rain here into the mid Atlantic where it's getting dry in, in the Carolinas. Okay. And to temperatures, now with, again, look at the reversal. This is the next five days. This is 6 to 10 day. Total reversal. Next five days, 6 to 10 day. What a flip-flop. Why? Because of this monster ridge and the upper low in the Gulf of Mexico. So temperatures, again, explode northward. Now, in the Gulf Coast, because of the cloud cover and the upper low, it stays actually a couple degrees below normal. Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and the Carolinas. But north, underneath the ridge, temperatures go way above normal in New England, northern Pennsylvania, not so much Virginia or Kentucky, but uh, the Great Lakes, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, the things really explode there. 80 is definitely coming. All right, so then after that, what happens? Well, this is the last slide here. Uh, 11 to 15 day, we get a trough here on the West Coast. This is a classic negative PNA. Okay, 
and uh, you get areas of low pressure coming out of the coming out of the low out of the trough, cutting across the plains Midwest with some rain chances. Okay, but it's fairly warm. Now you're not getting a huge ridge here. Okay, so you're not going to block the low pressure areas coming into the central and eastern U.S., but it is a mild pattern. Uh, there's no real blocking in Greenland or Canada, so this is a classic negative PNA energy coming out of the west coast, moving across the plains and Midwest, and it's a fairly warm pattern. So that's what we look like here. This is April 15th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, that sort of thing. All right, that's the presentation. Hopefully you enjoyed this week in weather. I'm your host meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I'll see you over on the Twitter page, over on the website, and over on the Facebook page.